please welcome our host, the Emory Stoops and Joyce King Stoops, Dean of the USC Rossier School of Education, Pedro Noguera. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us uh, for what we hope will be an enlightening session on how to create a new vision for schools uh, after the pandemic. Uh, this is the second in a series of webinars we are hosting this spring uh, in the hope of sparking some thinking about how to address some of the problems that have plagued education for many years and using the pandemic and the disruptions created as an opportunity for change. Today, uh, I'm joined by uh, a, a very uh, highly acclaimed panel of experts. Uh, with me today is uh, Professor Tyrone Howard, who is the um, faculty director of the UCLA Center for the Transformation of Schools and the Black Male Institute at UCLA. Anna Ponce, who is the executive director of Great Public Schools Now. Uh, Bruce Fuller, a sociologist and professor of education policy at UC Berkeley. And Sean Harper, provost professor of education and business at USC and the founder and executive director of the USC Race and Equity Center. Uh, all of these individuals have um, different perspectives based on their research and their work in the field of education that they will lend to this topic today. Uh, just to introduce us, um, <clears throat> I want you to think about the fact that since No Child Behind was enacted as law in 2001, equity, the pursuit of equity, that is ensuring that all children, regardless of their backgrounds, receive um, an adequate education has been the ostensible goal of US education policy in this country. However, as we know, many children have not had their needs met in school. In fact, the most consistent finding throughout the country is that family income combined with parent education are the strongest predictors for how well our children do in school. This means that in many cases, our schools are reproducing patterns of inequity. The question today is how do we change that? How do we create schools where all children, regardless of where they live, what language they speak, their race, their socioeconomic status, all children receive an education that prepares them to adequately um, uh, survive and thrive in the 21st century. So I'd like to invite the panelists to join me now as we pose some questions. Um, Anna, Tyrone, Bruce, Sean, if you could, uh, there you go, unmask yourselves. And, um, and I wanna start with a question to each of the panelists. Um, we all have known that the pandemic has exposed many inequities in our society. We see that um, the, the most vulnerable communities have been hardest hit uh, with the virus. And we know that similarly, the economic hardships have been hardest upon those who already were doing least well in our country. Uh, we see similar patterns in education with lack of access to learning opportunities. There are literally in California, hundreds if not thousands of kids now who are missing altogether, who can't be accounted for. So as you start to think about these equity challenges, what comes to mind for you? And what should we be thinking about um, as we begin to reopen to address these equity um, issues that have emerged? Why don't we start with you, Bruce, and then we'll move um, along to the others. Thank you, Pedro. Um, I wanna pick up on your point that when we have tried to put more money into schools, uh, sometimes it simply reproduces the same racial and class inequities that have marked the system for, for at least a couple centuries now. Um, I just wanna emphasize two things in terms of openers, Pedro. One is we've gotta really work with governors and state legislatures to focus the dollars on the schools that are serving the kids hardest hit by, by the pandemic. Uh, thanks to a new president, we have about, in California, we have about 22 billion new dollars coming into the school system. Uh, our governor has put up another four to five billion dollars. There's a lot of new money coming into the system, yet it's not clear that that money will go to the schools serving the kids that have suffered most under the pandemic. And my second point is really, once the money gets there, how do we ensure we're not reproducing tracking? How, how do we ensure we're not reproducing racially organized instruction? Um, 
And so the guts, inside the guts of this institution, we have to figure out how to work with teachers and principals to undo those inequities. Uh, very briefly, I think we have learned a lot uh, from past infusions into schools. Jerry Brown pumped in billions of new dollars to schools starting in 2013. We saw some high schools in LA focus more on college prep curriculum, college prep courses, AP courses, reducing racial disparities and access to those courses. Uh, we've seen in places like Culver City and Los Angeles where principals have to compete for the new dollars. So they come up with a uh, pro equity plan. They come up with um, micro interventions inside schools to reduce the, this reproduction of inequality. Uh, and I think coming out of this period, as you mentioned, Pedro, we have all sorts of digital innovations. We have smaller classes. We have small group sessions online uh, to focus on English learners, special education kids, those kids that are falling furthest behind. So I think we're coming out of this period with some experimentation, some innovations on the digital side. Uh, we, have, we have schools in Northern California that have reassigned cafeteria workers, secretaries to provide special tutorial for kids falling behind. So as you mentioned, Pedro, we've got to take advantage of this period, see what has worked, see how educators have thought out of the box and go into the internal guts of this institution to try to figure out less, less racialized ways of, of educating all kids and, and especially addressing those kids that have fallen behind or as you say, are unaccounted for. But let's not just throw money at the problem. Let's think about those institutional dynamics inside school organizations. Thanks, Bruce. Sean, I turn to you. Uh, I know that you were on the Biden transition team and you've also been working as an advisor to uh, Governor Newsom on, on these issues. How are you thinking about um, addressing equity as we reopen? Sure, uh, thank you, Dean Noguera, for bringing us together and thank all of you from across the country and perhaps around the world for joining us for this important conversation. Um, I obviously, like everybody else, um, am quite anxious for the pandemic to end. Um, I, I know that we're all, you know, pandemic fatigued and we're, we're ready to return to some version of normal. I want to offer a cautionary note, though, about returning to uh, sort of pre-pandemic normal versions of schooling that were grossly and terribly inequitable before the pandemic. And as you noted, Pedro, uh, so many of those inequities have been exacerbated by the pandemic. So let us not be in such a hurry to return to normal, but instead to think about a new, more equitable version of schooling here in the US. Um, I am going to insist that as we return to in-person schooling, that we pursue equity as opposed to equality. You know, there's, um, I agree with Bruce, you know, thanks to President Biden and the Biden administration, you know, there is going to be, you know, tremendous resources invested into pandemic recovery. An equity distribution requires us to be, you know, mindful about communities and schools that have been hardest hit and disproportionately impacted by the by the pandemic. Equality would be given giving every school in every school district the exact, you know, amount of resources. But every school in every district were not hit in the exact same way. We know that schools that disproportionately enroll Black, Latinx, and Indigenous students, most especially, um, you know, have been, you know, extremely disadvantaged. Uh, so we got to give even more money to those schools to correct, you know, the pandemic inequities and the longstanding inequities before the pandemic. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversation right now about learning loss, recovery. Um, it's a real thing. Um, there have been students who have lost so much learning over these past 12 months. But again, students with, you know, college educated parents or parents who had the luxury and the benefit of working from home and also homeschooling at the same time, you know, perhaps have had less learning loss, those who had stable, reliable uh, internet access, right? Um, and could participate fully in virtual schooling have likely had less learning loss than have students whose parents are essential workers and who have had to work every day since the onset of the pandemic. 
right? Uh, those who have not had the financial means to invest in you know, high-speed, reliable uh, Wi-Fi and so on. Uh, so that's you know, one set of issues that I'm thinking about. And quickly, I'll just say two other issues that I wanna make sure that we keep top of mind as we you know, imagine sort of a post-pandemic version of schooling. We have to provide grief and emotional wellness resources. Schools and colleges and universities were terrible before the pandemic at providing the adequate amount of um, mental wellness and emotional wellness resources. We have to be mindful that there will be students and they will be black and Latinx and indigenous students, most especially who will return to school having lost parents and family members disproportionately um, you know, to uh, COVID-19. We gotta make sure that we have the appropriate grief and, and emotional recovery resources for them. And let us not also forget about our Asian American and Pacific Islander and Asian um, students, faculty members and families as we return to schooling. I have been saying this since last April that we have to be prepared um, to protect those Asian and Asian American uh, students and members of our school communities um, as they return to schooling. Um, we now know uh, for sure what we knew nine months ago that they remain extremely vulnerable and under attack. It would be a real mistake to not have a strategy to protect uh, those Asian and Asian American and Pacific Islander persons. I'll stop there. Thanks, Sean. Anna, let me turn to you. Uh, you're the educational leader on our panel today. You, you work with schools uh, across the state. Um, from your perspective, what do you see as some of the, the major equity issues? We know a lot of superintendents right now are concerned about logistics of opening safely. What beyond the logistics should we be thinking about as particularly as it relates to equity? Yeah, lots of thoughts. Um, also, as a parent, uh, I have a nine-year-old third grader that I'm living this uh, pandemic um, with. And, uh, you know, just in terms of some of the equity issues that are top of mind for me is how little we've been listening to families and to students about their experiences and what they actually need. And without really hearing from them, it's, it's, it's difficult to start thinking about recovery or reopening. Um, and so that that's front and center for me is really figuring out how we're going to engage uh, families and students authentically in navigating the recovery process. Um, and to the point, Pedro, of compliance is the focus right now. And our kids are you know, they're, they're losing learning time and this uh, learning loss is accumulating. And uh, that is also top of mind for me. And I don't want this to become remediation. This is about thinking through how do we change existing practices? How do we just break through the traditional approach to teaching and really personalize and understand the needs of the students in the communities uh, that, you know, we're, serving. Um, and so that one is a really important one. Um, also the assessment piece. And, you know, there's a push to not assess, but how are we going to know the baseline and where we're starting from if we don't assess? Um, and the other one is also engagement. You know, right now, as you mentioned, we've lost a lot of kids and not just kids that were in school. Across the country, there was a drop of about 16 percent uh, of kindergartners that you know didn't enroll this year. And so those are the early years that are also really critical for the academic success of students. So quite a bit on my mind um, from you know an, a practitioner from the ground up. Um, and also how are we going to support our teachers uh, in going back, particularly to Sean's point of our kids are going, are they're going to need healing. And you know we can have more counselors, but it's also equipping the folks that are closest to the kids with the skills that they're going to need to be able to support them through the emotional and social resocialization process that they're going to be going through, especially uh, black and brown boys. I'm very concerned about um, how policies might change or not change in terms of returning to a compliance-based environment. Thank you, Anna. Um, Tyrone, um, 
from your perch there at UCLA. And I know that the center has been doing a lot of work focused on vulnerable populations. Um, what do you think the state and, and really the whole country should be doing differently to ensure that we are addressing the needs of the kids that we have consistently served least well? So thank you for the question, Pedro. Uh, Dean Nagara, sorry about that. And good to be here with this esteemed group of, of, of change agents. So let's be clear. We know that in this state, we serve over 6 million students. And to Bruce's point, we have a, a significant influx of, of money. We have over $20 billion that will flow into California schools because of the American Rescue Plan. Uh, that's about almost $4,800, $4,900 per pupil. So this is where the equity question comes into play because as Sean mentioned, we could use this one size fits all approach if we choose to, but that will essentially lead us to where we already are, where we have gross disparities across student groups in our state. I think if we really wanna do equity work in a real bold and unapologetic way, I think states have gotta be really intentional in California, especially because I think we oftentimes set an example for the rest of the nation to be really targeted to say, we're gonna be unapologetically bold to put more effort, more resources, more money, more funding into those districts and those vulnerable populations who have struggled mightily prior to the pandemic and who are suffering even more post pandemic. So let's name who those groups are. We know that we have over 1 million language learners in this state who we have not adequately served well. I think intentional kind of equitable resource around our language learners would be most impactful and have a huge impact, not only on the educational outcomes of our students, but for the health and vibrancy of our state. Let's keep going. Uh, at the Center for the Transformation of Schools, we did a study just this year. We found that we have over 270,000 young people who are experiencing homelessness in this state. That is unacceptable. Many estimates suggest that that number has gone up even considerably. And once we see the moratorium on evictions lifted, that number could easily double in the state of California, where we could see homeless students uh, in excess of half a million students. So why don't we put the essential supports in place to ensure that homeless liaisons have the kind of supports that they need to support students who are experiencing homelessness? Uh, we also have over 50,000 youth who are in foster care in this state, right? And we know the outcomes for youth in foster care are not what they need to be. We need to put intentional kinds of supports for our foster care population. Also, I think we need a real targeted focus on our black students in the state of California. We have continued to overlook the concerns of black students, despite the fact that they continue to make up seven, eight percent of our state's population and the outcomes have been woeful there. I think targeted intervention, naming the specific groups who have suffered tremendously during pandemic, after pandemic, is what equity should be about. Not to say we're going to use a one size fits all approach, but to say we recognize that there's some groups who have consistently lagged behind in our state and here's our opportunity to do so. I also want to raise this issue around learning loss because the learning loss moniker has given me some, some, some apprehension because it assumes that, number one, that certain students were learning in school prior to the pandemic happening, which we know was not the case. It also assumes that students who were at home were not learning. Uh, we've talked to a number of students who have said that, you know what, even as we resume back to schools, we don't want to completely throw out the baby with the bathwater, meaning that, that this form of, 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 of learning has worked for some students. We've had students tell us, why do I need to spend seven hours in school when I can work independently and get just as much done in two and a half hours and work to support my family, right? So we have to be willing to recognize that here is the rare moment and the rare opportunity to really think differently about how schooling is delivered. And I think that to some degree, remote learning should be here to stay. It has worked for a lot of our students. Uh, it has worked for a lot of them in terms of the ability to kind of be independent, that our older students in particular. And we also know that students have said, you know what, if I don't have to go back to the very schools that were hostile to me in the first place, that works. If I don't have to go back to the schools who were very dismissive of me in the First place that would work for me. I don't have to go back to the same schools where I suffer anxiety and bullying. That works for me as well. So I also will follow up with Sean's point that even as we come back, we have to have this real explicit focus on sort of the, the racialization of poverty, our vulnerable populations, as well as the mental health supports of our students. We have seen over the past year during the pandemic, according to data from the Center for the Disease Control, the number of youth suicides has gone up dramatically because students are suffering from anxiety, from depression, from isolation. And even with that, that cannot be a one size fits all approach. We have seen boys, we have seen LGBTQ plus youth, and we've seen black and Latinx students have had higher rates of suicide completion than anybody over the past year. So that's where our equity focus around mental health has to be targeted to those groups and those communities where it's taboo to even talk about issues around mental health, we have to normalize the idea that it's okay to say I'm not okay. So those are just some of the issues that come to mind for me off the top of my head. Thank you, Tyrone. 
So there are two themes that came up that um, where I see some, some differences here. One is the question of assessment. We know the Biden administration has called for students to be assessed this spring. And there's a lot of controversy around that because um, for obvious reasons, not everybody thinks that inviting kids to come back to school be tested is necessarily a good idea. So I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. And and because it also relates to this question of learning loss. How do we assess to, to know what the needs of kids are um, and, and, and to address those needs? So anyone who would like to jump in to, um, to address either of those questions. Well, I'll jump in from uh, a practitioner perspective, you know, if we don't know where the kids are, then what, what are, where are we working from? Um, and it's not about, again, going back to, it's not about remediation. It's about really understanding where they are starting from and accelerating their learning. And, you know, it's also an opportunity to rethink the role of standardized a, a test and whether they're the only thing we use or not. And what are there? There's lots of other assessments that folks have been using right now that are actually, you know, sort of providing models of how you can monitor progress in different ways. And trust me, my son is being assessed via Zoom. So I've seen it firsthand and I know that it's challenging, but there are strategies that can be used to. Um, uh, to assess in, in a way that is going to capture where students are. And um, also, you know, sort of like this concept of assessment for progress and not punishment or consequence is really important. And, uh, and I do unapologetically believe that we cannot address learning loss without having a baseline from where we're starting. Anyone else wanna chime in on that? Just two quick points, Pedro. One is we've been tracking teachers intensively in 18 schools around California, and they're feeling enormous pressure around learning loss to hit these state learning standards. And on the one hand, that might be a, a progressive worry, but on the other hand, it might push teachers to become even more didactic than they were before. So I think, I think this resumption of standardized testing might distort the pedagogy and, and, and in a sense not disengage kids in, in creative ways that they, they otherwise might might engage in. I want to go back to something Tyrone said that I think is really important. Um, you know, there were particular versions of school that were psychologically and academically hazardous uh, for particular students. We've long known this. Testing the heck out of kids is one of those one of those practices, right? I think that it is a mistake to focus on trying to test kids as we're just barely bringing them back to school environments. We're reacclimating them to uh, the social space that is schooling and and classrooms. Um, you know, we're trying to figure out how to physically distance them, how to support those who are still learning virtually. I, it feels to me like we have enough to do right now um, and that, you know, trying to figure out, you know, ways to test kids, just maybe, maybe we should do that after we settle back in. It just doesn't feel like it ought to be at the top of the priority list right now. Yeah, I, I, I want to just echo what what each of the the, the panelists have said. Yeah, there's so many other ways we should be thinking about, you know, where where we're place, placing our emphasis on our students first. I've been saying for long, we ha we have to let students Maslow before they bloom. Uh, we can't just rush back into this whole idea of getting kids assessed. And 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 most most effective teachers will tell you, look, we can use uh, informal learning, we can use summative learning. We have other more other modes of assessment that help us to know what that base what that baseline is that Anna talked about, right? Uh, and and part of what we have to use in this moment is a chance to really begin to think about how do we sort of make sense out of some of these arbitrary content standards that we have in place that were really problematic, again, prior to the pandemic, that were based on these lockstep developmental appropriate sort of stages of what we think kids should know at certain times. Who says we have to have those? There's a great uh, article in the Atlantic just last month that says, you know what? We had so many issues with regard to assessment before the pandemic. Here is our opportunity for a reset, for a rethinking, for a reimagining of how we explore learning. I mean, one of the things that some folks have called for is that we can really recon re reconstruct the way we do elementary school by look having kids spend more time outside exploring and, and spending more time in environments and beginning to, to do the kind of discovery learning that we say is so important. So let's not go back to what 
what we had, which we know was highly problematic in the first place, and really begin to think boldly and, and sort of uh, in an imaginative way. So we're getting several questions from our audience, but before we turn to them, I want to pose one more question. Now, I want to use a quote. It's a quote um, from Hugh Vasquez. He's with the National Equity Project, and it's a quote I've turned to several times. He says, um, how do we... <clears throat> He says, since we know that disturbance is required for change, and there's no doubt that disturbance has happened, the question is, are we willing to use this opportunity to create the kind of educational system we want? We have learned that if we are going to change the system, we as individuals first have to see what the system is producing. Then we have to engage with others to design something different. And finally, we have to act. This question, can we see what the system has produced? I started by saying we've seen the inequities, right? The predictable patterns. As, as uh, we have many educational leaders listening in today, where should they focus their attention in making changes so that we don't just return to what we know already, the, the norm that was not serving many kids well? I have a couple thoughts on this. Uh, one of them, I'm just gonna unapologetically just steal from Anna. We have to talk to parents and family members and privilege them as experts and as partners in the redesign of, of this something different that we're talking about. We also have to privilege teachers as experts, um, not just as the people who you know execute the plans that were developed by somebody else, um, or the policies that were developed by someone else or the assessments, right? Um, you know, those are, th those are two uh, groups that I, I think for sure we got to engage in this, re in this exercise of reimagining. Anybody else? I think we need, it's an opportunity for us to really think about student engagement differently. Um, and, you know, we've seen it just explode versus where, kids are connected or they're not connected. The whole sense of belonging is sort of not there right now. And how are we thinking about that in terms of reopening schools, resocialization, and also recovery? And I think, you know, I, I see a lot of uh, schools also doing project-based learning, even via Zoom, because they want the kids to be engaged and connected and, you know, talking to one another. And what is that going to look like? What are those experiences that we're going to bring into this new way of engaging kids in their education and giving them that ownership? I think that's an incredible opportunity that we have right now. And, you know, not be compliance driven. Yeah, Pedro, I'd, I'd agree with Sean. I think we have to legitimate teachers' capacity to check in with kids, to get to know kids. To res I think it's a new era for teachers to respect kids' cultural heritage and linguistic heritage. Uh, we've, been, we've been observing videotaped Zoom sessions over the last several months that teachers provide us in our, pro in our project. And teachers are very skilled in talking, asking, what did you do over the weekend? Hold up your new cat. Uh, how's your sister doing? I mean, these teachers are very trying to connect uh, in very human ways. We've got to legitimate that and not just jump back to cognitive testing and forget all we've learned about the ability of teachers to, to check in and respect kids' uh, backgrounds and what they're worried about. Yeah, yeah, I would also say, let us be careful though, because I agree with everything that Sean and Anna have said. I think we should be talking to students, but, but, but let's be careful what we ask for. So if we ask students, how can schools be differently, uh, be done different, and, and we don't want to hear the ways in which they may push back on the sort of didactic ways we've done schools, then let's not even bother asking. Because I think for years, students have told us what is not working for them in schools. And when they've told us that we have pushed them away, when they've told us that we've silenced them, when they've told us that we've punished them. So part of what students oftentimes say is, look, I tell you every day when I choose not to show up in your class, what's wrong with your school? I told you every single day what's wrong with your classroom. That's why I've been disruptive here because you're not teaching us, right? So I think if we're serious about this, let's truly listen to students, but we the adults have got to be willing to really begin to think our practice is different, to rethink our policies in a different way, to think about our procedures in ways that we have not in the past. I think the problem has never been young people. Young people bring their full humanity and all the creative and imaginative ways in which they want to think about learning. It's we the adults who get stuck in how we were educated and how we've always known school 
schools who don't want to reconfigure the way we do schooling. So I say, be careful what you ask for, because students will oftentimes say, and we found this in some of the studies we're doing right now, why are you asking if you're really not going to in incorporate what we're doing? I love the book by Carla Shalaby, Troublemakers, because in that book, what Carla Shalaby talks about, the very students that we should be listening to the most about how schools can be different are the ones we label as troublemakers and we push out because they're disrupting the status quo. They're saying that this doesn't work for me. They say it's dehumanizing, it's not affirming. So again, if we're really serious about going down this road, let's go all the way down the road. All right. Well, thank you for that. Let me take some of the questions we're getting from our audience. Um, here, here's a question, and, and I think it, it comes from the fact that equity is often a kind of mushy um, slogan that gets used a lot, hard to pin down, hard to know it. So as you think about equity, how should we think about in terms of um, uh, calibrating it, measuring it? How do we know if, if we're in fact moving in an equitable direction? What are some indicators we, sh we should be looking for? Sean, you, you do equity audits all the time. You got to tell us. <laughs> yeah, well, look, before I get into the indicators, let me say that equity uh, requires reparations, right? Um, we have to repair the historical harm and negligence um, that has disadvantaged particular uh, populations of people in the schools they, they attend. Um, you know, when will we know that we're achieving equity? We'll see it in the outcomes in the student performance outcomes. We'll see it in the funding uh, outcomes. Um, you know, it's quantifiable, right? That, you know, we, we have um, made the investments that needed to be made to correct the historical funding inequities that have disadvantaged uh, particular schools. We will see it in the outcomes of the employees. Uh, we will see, um, you know, a more equitable distribution of highly qualified teachers and school leaders and counselors and staff who stay in, in, in schools and support kids in you know, equitable ways as opposed to the revolving door that we tend to see in predominantly black and brown uh, schools. Um, those are just you know, some, I could, I could go all day, honestly, with laying out um, the equity indicators. I won't, um, I'll, I'll give others an opportunity. And let me just add, we don't have to only focus on the indicators because uh, we have educational leaders on here who are now have resources that they didn't have before. Where should they be investing those resources to drive this equity agenda that we've been talking about today? Can I chime in? I think we, we look, we know for a long time, early child education matters. If we, if we started to really double, triple down our efforts around early child education, in particular li literacy. I think there are some indicators there that suggest we can see some progress. We can look at third and fourth grade reading sort of outcomes to begin to understand where we can have better input. We can look at our indicators around if we're reducing the number of suspensions and expulsions that we see in schools that, that are, are another indicator, especially when we're suspending and expelling those children who have some serious emotional uh, psychological challenges that they're facing with. I think another indicator can be where, where are we putting our resources around college and career readiness placement uh, that so many of our students need? That, that can be another indicator. And I think we can also put some indicators just on overall teacher satisfaction, right? Teachers have been our, uh, some amazing sort of uh, just, just she roles and he roles and they roles in this moment, right? In terms of keeping the, 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 the fort together in these times, right? Let's talk about teacher satisfaction. Let's talk about teacher supports. How are teachers uh, needing to be uh, supported in ways? I mean, we know teachers have said for years, for example, that smaller class sizes would make a difference. So that's oftentimes, you know, collectively bargained. So that's something that, we sh that should be considered. But even having uh, psychological supports, nurses, counselors, psychiatric social workers, uh, those are indicators that we can numerically look at when you've got schools that have high poverty needs and they have single they have single social workers or no social workers at all. We can begin to say, why don't we put more of those supports in place where the schools have the greatest need? Yeah, let me jump back in. I completely agree with Tyrone. Um, you know, something else came to mind for me. We have to also take an equitable approach to the, the actual, Pedro, I appreciate that you, that you moved us beyond the logistics of reopening. Um, that makes a lot of sense, right? But the logistics also though have to be executed in an equitable fashion. Um, you know, I'm thinking about 
our university, right? Like I've gone to campus, you know, a handful of times over, you know, the past two or three months. And it is stunning, all of the signage and all of the efforts that our well-resourced university has taken to prepare for uh, the return of, of students and employees to campus, right? Um, I imagine that there are some schools that have also, you know, prepared in a similar fashion with just like impressive PPE and signage and other kinds of things. But I also know for sure that the schools that enroll and educate lower income students, black, brown, indigenous and Pacific Islander students probably haven't had the resources to prepare in the exact same way, right? So, you know, I, I, I would argue that we have to, you know, we have to invest more money and resources into preparing those schools to be safe so that we, we don't have these disruptions of, you know, outbreaks in, in those schools because we didn't do it right um, in anticipation of people returning. Pedro, I would just add, I think districts and states can identify innovations that have been effective. Uh, Tyrone mentioned class size. We've seen schools that have, that have uh, cut class size in half so that half the fifth grade is taught in one session. The other half is taught later in the morning and then afternoons are used for asynchronous and more creative project-based learning. Uh, these sorts of innovations wouldn't have happened without a pandemic, but, but rather than just rubber banding back to the old, same old normal, I think district leaders could really uh, spread the word about these organizational innovations, pedagogical, digital innovations that have worked. So we avoid just going back to a system that, that wasn't serving black and brown kids well to begin with. Anna? Very quickly, um, I, I also think that it's important to look at some of the maybe less tangible indicators, um, just in terms of going back to the engagement piece, if, uh, if students are engaged in their schooling, uh, the sense of belonging, both for the students and the families, um, the idea of school as a joyful place, I think really contributes to positive outcomes because, and that starts early and it has to build through. And I don't think that we've paid that much attention to those indicators as much as we should. And also the um, SEL, the social emotional learning should not be on the side if we get to it, it should be core of what we do every day in every school. So several um, of the questions um, focus on teachers. And uh, one of the things I know is that many teachers are also burnt out because they've been teaching on Zoom. Think about the teachers who have children at home and teaching uh, on Zoom, and now we're saying teach summer school too. Um, how do we reopen with a thought of how to support teachers adequately? We're saying that they may have to step up to provide some of that mental health support for kids. Um, how do we do this without overloading them and making sure that this job, we, you know, there's a lot of concerns about a teacher shortage in the state because many teachers are saying this job is not worth it anymore. Um, we need to figure out how do we make this job attractive and sustainable. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, how much time we got for that one? That's that's <laughs> a that's a that's a that's a big one. But you're spot on, uh, uh, Pedro, because I think yeah, teachers have been overwhelmed and overworked even before the pandemic, and it's only been ratcheted up. But there's some there's some I think some small sort of some low hanging fruit that we can take. So for example, one of the things we know is that, uh, you know, Bruce mentioned again, this idea of sort of smaller class size, where can we do that? Paraprofessionals are huge in this moment, right? Paraprofessionals make a big difference in the overall workload that teachers have. And oftentimes what we know is with paraprofessionals, they are oftentimes more diverse than our teaching population. So we get a tool for it. We get more diversity in our, our teaching ranks, but we also get more support for our teachers. So uh, lots of schools are struggling with getting, you know, more than just part-time paraprofessionals. If we had more paraprofessionals and at full-time levels, that would make a big impact in, in terms of additional teacher supports. I also think we need to do something that was tried, uh, that I thought was completely, that was really radical in Portland, Oregon some years ago, where they even played with the idea of giving teachers part-time sabbaticals, right? What would it look like if you gave a teacher 
a, a, a three or four month sort of a, sort of a recharge period where they said, you know what, we're going to give you a chance to sort of step back and rethink and recharge and rejuvenate at the same level of pay so that when you come back, you, you spent some time professional development wise, you spent some time then just just physiologically just sort of recovering. I think, you know, academics get that opportunity. What would it look like for K-12 teachers to have the opportunity to have sabbatical uh, time or pay or job sharing that did not result in them having uh, a loss of income or loss of salary? I think this is the time where again, listening to teachers, hearing teachers about what kinds of supports would help could help us to begin to, again, rethink something else in terms of how we best support them. Anyone else want to chime in about teachers? Pedro, I would just say, I mean, to second Tyrone's point, I think this is the time to diversify teaching staffs and around the country um, through innovative teacher training programs, four-year degrees with clinical training wrapped into it. We're going to need thousands of more pre-K teachers as the federal administration expands preschool. This is a time to rethink pre-service teacher training and make sure that the teaching force reflects the heritage of, of our students. And it might also be an opportunity to rethink credentialing and the requirements that we have on, you know, who, who can be in a classroom and who can't be in the classroom with kids depending on the credential. Uh, and I do think that there's leverage for expanding paraprofessional uh, responsibilities and also partnering with support providers and pushing them more into the schools in different ways. You know, especially like in summer school, it could be that, you know, the teacher is only teaching for an hour or two and then they go to a support provider for the rest of the afternoon or something like that, that doesn't necessarily tap into the existing uh, system staffing, but does bring other partners in to support right now. I realize this is gonna sound terribly basic, but we should ask them. We should ask teachers what their needs are, what their ideas are. We should involve them as co-designers of the kinds of uh, relief and recovery um, efforts that, 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 that are potentially on the table. Um, I bet if we engaged them, they would tell us. I bet they come with all sorts of amazing ideas. Some of those ideas will not be doable. They will not be affordable. But I imagine that there'll be numerous ideas that are incredibly creative and can actually be done. Uh, but we first must bring them to the table. And I don't mean just their union representatives, right? Um, but yeah, we got to be much more deliberate about asking teachers. So we got a, um, a question about school boards, um, because as we know that we have locally elected officials who are responsible. Um, what what can, uh, role can they play in this, in this work um, that's unique to that role as an elected official in a local community? Any thoughts on that? You know, one of the things, Pedro, that seems to be a through line with each of our responses is the importance of data, data, data. Uh, especially evidence that comes from those who are on the ground, parents, students, caregivers, educators. I think school boards can play a vital role in making sure that there is an ongoing database that is robust and rich and ongoing to understand what is happening and what do people need and where are the shortcomings and where are the gaps and, and, and what do people need to be able to do their jobs better? And what do people need to support their students at home? What kinds of after school programs do we have in place? What kinds of uh, professional learning opportunities do we provide for our teachers and our leaders? I think school boards have got to be in listening mode, listening mode, listening mode, because as they get prepared to make some really huge decisions about how this funding will be allocated to do so in a manner that's not informed by the very opinions and perspectives that myself, Anna, Sean, and Bruce have talked about will be a huge missed opportunity. Yeah, I wanna pick up where I left off and combine it with what Tyrone just said here and something he said earlier. Um, so I just called for us to bring teachers to the table and ask them what their needs are, how we could better serve them, right? So yes, we have to listen, but then we also have to do something with what we hear. It can't be just that we bring them to the table for the ceremonial uh, listening session, right? Um, as Tyrone said earlier, students have been telling us for generations how we could better educate them. Similarly, teachers have been telling us for generations how we can better support them. So during this time, as school board members are listening, they also got to do something with what they hear. Uh, they have to come to the table open-minded about you know, new versions of schooling 
that will help us redress the longstanding inequities and you know, you know, other parts of, of schooling that have been terribly ineffective. I would just add uh, that school boards can also reach out to the nonprofit community. Uh, a lot of us do work in Los Angeles and a lot of the most exciting, innovative reform ideas have come from inner city struggle, the ACLU. Uh, these are groups like Anna's very own organization that have really put out out of the box ideas and school boards can have a real legitimating role in listening and, and backing some of those creative ideas. So here's an out of the box idea that Anna alluded to, which is rethinking the whole school year. Um, you know, we've been on this kind of agrarian schedule for a long time. Um, we, and now we have this tremendous need to address what kids didn't get before. Um, and people are thinking about how to get creative with summer. Um, any thoughts about that? How do we start to just change the whole mode and approach the way we're engaging kids and, um, and, and moving out of some of those traditional approaches that um, just haven't served us well? I think there is a pandemic lesson here. As recently as 14 months ago, we would not have imagined that we would be able to connect technologically with children in the ways that, that we have. We did it because we were forced to do it, right? Um, in that same way, I, I wonder, right, like if we, we're imagining ourselves being forced to rethink, you know, these sort of traditional archaic notions of, of schooling, right? Like what we might come up with and, and the role of, of leveraging technology even. Um, I'm not talking about having people, you know, sit on Zoom all day. Um, I, I don't mean that, but I do mean that um, th there are some things that we've learned this year about what's possible um, in, in, in the reimagining of, of this thing that we call schooling. Um, so I, I think that we ought to be inspired by what we've learned. See, this is why we also shouldn't just rush back to testing the heck out of kids, right? Can we take some reflective time for teachers, school leaders, school board members, parents and family members to just take stock actually of some of the good things that we've learned about teaching and learning and student support and student engagement over these past uh, 12, 14 months or whatever. And you know, what of that can we preserve? What can we replicate and perhaps even scale as we, as we think about how to educate children better? And I think this is really um, an opportunity to not just look at you know, the school day, the school year, but also how we use the space in schools that a classroom is not four walls, that you don't have to sit at a desk in a chair, that learning can actually be much more authentic and organic during the day and within the space that you're in. And again, I go back to like, how do we leverage the community partners, the other support providers that are already in many schools, particularly high need schools, to, to think about those structures differently and uh, really push on the systems that prevent them from, from happening. And I go back to credentialing. Like that is a huge barrier because you have to have a teacher with the kids. And even though, you know, you can't split them into two unless they're in the same classroom. And, you know, that goes back to the idea of how do we change space? And right now we're looking at outdoor classrooms everywhere across the country. Like, what can we learn from that? and bring it into our practice, you know, and we're in Southern California. Darren, I know you have to leave soon. Any other thoughts? Yeah, so I love this question, Pedro. You're right, we've had this agrarian model in place for centuries now, right? And I think this can be our chance to reconsider this. I love what Anna just said about space, right? Who says learning has to always take place in the confines of the four walls, right? I know as a, as a professor, when we were in, 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 in person, there were times I would take my class outside just to be outside to talk and think and learn. It provides us a sort of a different way to engage in the learning process. There's been a body for years that said we should start the school day later. If we just move the start of the school day back an hour, that it could reduce the number of 
accidents that we have on the roads, it would it, it, kids would come to school oftentimes more alert and more ready to learn. So let's talk about what would it look like if our school day started later? Who would say we have to have students in, in school for seven hours? Uh, we can begin to modify. What does it look like to have learning pods where we have small group instruction for some kids, whole group instruction for some kids, one-on-one -on -one time at different times? We have some teachers who have fallen to that lecture, lecture, lecture mode all day, every day, and kids are telling us that does not work for me. Let me get up. Let me engage in more problem-based learning. Let me engage in more small pair share kinds of instruction, right? I think we have to begin to also think about how this thing called technology that has been a game saver for us is still an integral part of how we think about learning. Our young people have been engaged with technology from a gaming standpoint for a long time. And they say that they learn much more in the gaming space than they do in the traditional classroom space. So we also have to think about how do we hold on to some of the technological sort of tools that we've learned how to how to manage in this period and also incorporate that into our new reimagined school. I just think we have to think about space, place, engagement, all the things we've said here in a way that's much more robust and much more sort of interactive than we've seen in years past. So um, I want to go back to the issue of money um, because as we know, there is more money being made available and money can be a good thing unless it's wasted. And, and I think we should all be concerned that there'll be a lot of waste um, uh, with this federal money that's coming into the, into the states for education. I, I had, uh, we have an experience here in California with the local control funding formula of many districts not knowing how to use those resources to drive equity. I had a superintendent ask me, says I have more uh, kids in foster care than any uh, district in the, in the state. How should I spend the money to help them? How do we make sure that the school leaders are getting good guidance on how to use these funds so that they're not wasted and this doesn't become a scandal later on? Well, again, Pedro, I, I do think district leaders need to figure out what has been working dur during this period. How do we get to these out-of-the-box innovations and then spread the, that, that experience and that evidence to, to school principals? I think in LA Unified and other districts, money comes in and principals just sort of their eyes light up and it's like, well, I can plug this in to open up another bathroom or I can buy this new textbook. But we've got to get principals to think more holistically uh, about kids. As Sean and others have said, we've got to think about and respect these youngsters as, as complex creatures with feelings and thoughts and ideas of their own. Um, but that, that takes some work on the ground inside the school organization with principals to get them to think more holistically in a more innovative fashion, rather than just handing the money out as if it's, enough, as if it's more Title I money or more special ed money uh, filling holes in, in a school. So one thought um, is really thinking about how the comprehensive recovery plans are going to be developed at the district level and at the school site level and how those support services sort of build on one another and not just one off support services that uh, will, you know, sort of just be gone when the money is gone. Um, but like what, what, what are they going to leave? What are those investments going to leave behind? Tutoring, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, we know is the best practice in terms of helping kids. Very expensive. Works if you do it at least three hours a week. So if you do one-on-one -on -one tutoring and you only give kids one hour, the impact of that is, is not going to be as significant at, as if you followed the research of a minimum of three hours. So I think looking at what those are and how they fit into the bigger picture and then doing whatever investments really, really well and not cutting them back to make the dollars go farther or maybe not believing that the, it should be three hours of tutoring. Um, but going back to that plan, I think is really important and getting the supports. And in California, we have the LCAP, right? Which I assume is gonna be one of the plans that's gonna be followed. And how, how are you looking at it over time and also seeing what's working and what needs to be tweaked? Because we have the time to tweak what's not working. Yeah, I'm gonna present here um, an idea that I presented to a superintendent last week, and I think she's actually going to do it. Uh, the idea, my recommendation was to form a 30 person, a 30 member expert investment advisory council. 
and that that council ought to have actual academic experts who can you know do various kinds of financial modeling and you know actually have studied and you know know something about you know finance in schools but we also should have some teachers parents and family members and community members some school board members as well as some actual students on that council um there are only 30 slots so you got to be very thoughtful about you know the composition of the group but that group um that represents you know the various sectors within within a district you know could be you know very helpful in giving advice on how to spend the money um in an equitable way and to make sure that we're not wasting it on you know bathroom renovations i'll say this and, and it may be controversial so i'll say this and then i'll hop off because i have to leave so i'll let you all figure it all out but pedro you're spot on about the fact that you know through the work we did for the center for the transformation of schools that the lcff funding formulas that have been in our state for some time principals are not always informed with adequate information about how to make the best decisions and here's the controversial part the other piece to this is that there are some principals who have really been um not transparent about how those decisions have been made uh there have been some principals who have oftentimes put yes people around them to kind of sort of sign off on what they wanted to see happen there have been some school leaders who wanted to keep some people out of the decision making process who they knew would raise concerns and questions about how funding was going to be allocated there have been some leaders who have been very deliberate about making sure that teachers did not have a say so so in this moment leaders are going to have to be much more open book uh, are going to have to really make a more explicit effort to engage all stakeholders in our respective communities. There are lots of parents and caregivers who know nothing about LCFF, know nothing about the fact that they have the ability to have input and voice and votes about how funding gets spent. And I think it's going to require all stakeholders, leaders, as well as teachers, as well as support staff and parents to make sure that they're all at the table to the idea that Sean talks about. That's what the spirit of LCFF is supposed to be about. But we know the actual implementation, unfortunately, in some of our districts has not looked that way. The implementation of some of our schools has not looked that way. And then when you have people who are wondering why hasn't the funding been used to where the greatest needs are, and, and, then, and then they realize that they were not even at the table, I think it raises a huge, huge sort of equity issue. So I think from the standpoint of leaders being much more transparent, uh, much more inclusive, and, and really being able to have people who may not see eye to eye with them at the table is going to be fundamental as well. So I'll say that, and I'll leave and run on that. I want to say thank you all. It's been great. And uh, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you, Tyrone. And, and we'll, we'll just take about another 10 minutes uh, for the, the rest of you. Um, in keeping with the title of this uh, webinar series, A New Vision for Schools, um, several of you alluded to the fact that if we organize schools with kids in mind, we might not end up with the kind of schools we have now, right? The, um, I often say that uh, we expect kids to learn the way we teach. We don't necessarily teach them the way they learn. What are some other ways in which, in order to drive equity, educators should be thinking about differently about how to approach working with kids, working with families, working with, um, with, with kids of different backgrounds who haven't been served well? Um, that, that come to mind for you. This is a chance, again, to um, introduce some ideas that hopefully will resonate out there with educators. I think the, um, the going back to engagement, but you know, there, I've seen a number of schools really um, invest a lot into project-based learning. Again, really sort of creating those experiences for kids um, that I think is, um, it's just important and also how we are, this is uh, an opportunity for us to rethink parent engagement, family engagement, and how are we building from uh, this year of uh, connecting with parents and seeing them as partners in the education of their kids. And I've also seen a number of schools that have tried different things, you know, from having weekly check-in times, drop-in times. Now it's a lot easier to have a parent conference via Zoom on a phone or anywhere. So how are we thinking about that family engagement differently moving forward? So in some ways you're saying that, that this has opened up new possibilities mm -hmm. for engagement. Anybody else? 
Well, I think, Pedro, the digital tools have been revolutionary in terms of engaging many parents, you know, using Google Classroom where parents could just go in and see what the weekly schedule is for their kids, uh, easy texting devices. So, you know, sometimes these are bells and whistles, but they've also eased the, the ability of teachers to be in constant touch with parents. And as Anna's saying, we need to enrich that. Uh, Tyrone mentioned, I think it was Tyrone mentioning getting kids outside. Um, you know, one of, one of the great innovations in LA at the high school and middle school level is getting kids out in communities doing surveys, getting kids on street corners to interview unemployed individuals, you know, allowing kids to delve into their own social historical experiences in their, in their, in their neighborhoods. These are all ways, you know, th this, this might tap over to common core standards in history, but it has immediate visceral meaning if we can get kids outside in their communities, uh, perhaps politically engaged, dialoguing with various adults, craftspeople, uh, these are all ways in which we motivate kids and, and, and it has direct meaning to these youngsters rather than sitting in classrooms for six, seven hours a day. Before I answer, um, I want to go back and maybe gently revise uh, something that I said earlier, perhaps even take it back. Um, it's, it was my comment about renovating bathrooms. Um, I got inspired by uh, something Bruce, Bruce said about bathrooms, right? Um, but, you know, upon reflection, you know, if you really want to get a sense of, uh, of equity uh, between, among, and across schools, go to the bathrooms in those schools. Does it look like a filthy uh, roadside um, gas station bathroom? Uh, that's what the bathrooms look like in many places that educate black and brown kids. Um, so I, it's just a critique that I've that I've often offered, right? Of, of, of even the bathroom situation. So maybe just maybe some of these funds should be used to uh, make the bathrooms not look so filthy, um, and you know, design them with kids in mind. Uh, so there's that. Now the question, Pedro, about designing with kids in mind begs for me the question of now which kids are we talking about, right? If we really want to be bold and radical. Um, and if we really want to be equity minded, we have to name the specific racial and ethnic groups that are often forgotten about or chronically disadvantaged or miseducated in our schools. I completely agree with, I believe it was Anna who said, you know, we cannot take a sort of uh, a, an all lives matter. Anna didn't say this, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, right? We can't take an all lives matter approach to schooling when the data make very clear to us that black kids and brown kids and indigenous kids and Pacific Islander kids are chronically underserved and left behind and that their lives don't matter in the curriculum. So what I'm calling for here is race consciousness in our work moving forward, in our policies, in our curriculum, in our pedagogical practices, in, our, in, in the way that we attempt to reculture schools, um, that, that would be bold. We cannot have a raceless, all lives matter approach to schooling moving forward if we want it to be equitable. All right, so we're, we're, we're winding down. I wanna get some final thoughts, um, but I'm encouraged by the fact that this recent, um, uh, this, this, the, the package that, that the Biden administration launched and was approved by Congress is gonna bring not only a lot of resources throughout the country, but particularly to families, low-income families with children. One estimate is they could lift, literally lift half the kids who are currently in poverty out of poverty. And what this suggests is that maybe for the first time ever, we won't expect schools alone to solve some of the many issues facing our society that really do relate to poverty. Um, as you think about these possibilities in this particular moment, um, and what, it, what it, it allows schools to do differently um, in the pursuit of equity. I, I wonder if you could leave us with some final thoughts about how we could expect schools to begin to address some of the, 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 the historic and structural challenges that have so long um, contributed to division um, based on race and class and language and polarization in this country. Um, I think we're at a moment where many of us are hoping 
that education can really be a resource that can guide us into a better future. And uh, any, any final thoughts on that would be appreciated. Well, Pedro, I would, I would just quickly say that I think you're absolutely right. We've got to think outside the school walls. We have to think about these underlying structural and racial dynamics in American society. Uh, I think the Biden administration so far is far more revolutionary than we expected from our grandfatherly uh, leader. You know, he's really come forward through refundable tax credits, child care credits, aid for pre-K. He's really trying to embolden lower income and lower middle class families in ways which could open up those opportunities again. Um, and secondly, I think, as we've said about families, uh, honest hit on this most, most vividly, I think, but we've really got to, we've really learned maybe from the past year that parents are partners in all of this. You know, teachers as professionals sometimes look down their nose at parents or they think low income parents you know, are disadvantaged and therefore don't have cultural resources to invest in their kids. I think we're, I think we can move past that and really see parents as having assets in the home struggling to do the best for their kids. And that attitudinal shift could, could be equally uh, revolutionary. I would say that it's also time to um, uh, recognize the intersectionality of issues to the framing of this session, um, uh, the other issues that relate to uh, kids accessing an education and what role can a school play? And you know, I'm coming from Camino Nuevo Charter Academy, which was a place-based uh, centered organization. We, we strongly believed in community schools before community schools was a term, but the power of that and how you bring partners and how you address those barriers to learning before the kids actually even get to the school campus can be, you know, uh, uh, supported by those partnerships and really bringing in the other entities to support with issues like health and housing and workforce development that the schools don't have to do, but we just have to think of a model differently on how we can actually bring those supports and resources to the kids and their families so that, you know, we can move beyond the, the to Bruce's point, outside the school walls and really think of communities and empowering the communities to solve through their own challenges as well. Yeah, Pedro, as you mentioned, I had the enormous privilege of serving on the education policy team for the Biden-Harris campaign. And, you know, we thought very deeply about this that, you know, we have to invest in, um, in cross-sector partnerships and the cultivation of cross-sector partnerships like uh, Anna just uh, talked about. We also have to invest in cross-sector data systems, uh, data systems that speak to each other, uh, where the education data speaks to the health data about a kid and about you know, what, what we know from the human services or social services data um, about that kid and, and that family and those neighborhoods and so on. Um, you know, there are some communities across the country that have invested in those data systems, um, but others have not had the resources to do so. So we, we, we have to invest not just in the partnerships, but also in those mutually informing uh, data systems. Thank you for that. And, and I wanna thank you all. I, I want to um, just say it's been a rich discussion um, and, and I appreciate the thought each of you brought to it. I, I wanna leave us with a quote. Uh, this quote comes from Paul Revel. Uh, he's a former commissioner of education, Massachusetts. And it, it really speaks to the comments we heard from several of you today. He says, how do we make our school education and child development systems more individually responsive to the needs of our students? Why not construct a system that meets children where they are and gives them what they need inside and outside of school in order to be successful? Let's take this opportunity to end the one size fits all factory model of education. And, and when you think about that quote coming, you know, Massachusetts is considered the top performing state uh, in the country. And he describes it as a one size fits all system. And we know it's a system that has not served many kids well. Uh, equity is about acknowledging the differences and responding to the needs. And I think each of you have uh, spoken to that in very important ways. So I wanna thank you all for um, your time today. Really appreciate it. 
Thank you, Tyrone. I know you are onto something else. Uh, thank all of you who tuned in. We had a great turnout today. Over 700 people tuned in live and many more on Facebook. So um, the work continues um, and uh, I look forward to working with each of you in creating the schools our children deserve. Thank you.